Comic book adaptations are everywhere these days, but in the early 2000s, they were a bit more of a rarity. One movie that came out in 2004 and made an impression, positioning the director for much bigger things, was Hellboy. This was his follow-up to the Fantastic Blade 2, and thus not his first foray into comic book movies. Now, let's get this clear from the start. Mr. Del Toro is a monster cinema god to me, so this is clearly going to be a love letter. However, I see this one as a 9 out of 10, actually preferring the sequel to the first one. Why? Well, it's complicated and very much a question of story and villains. But here I am to discuss the first Hellboy film made by Del Toro, so it will be given tons of love. Let's start with a little history. My knowledge of comic books is not where some would think it should be. It's not the best as I admittedly do not read them. I did read some as a kid like Asterix, Tintin, Lucky Luke, Smurfs, Leonard, Archie, The Crow, and a few more. But since becoming an adult, the only few comics I've read have been The Crow and Video Nasty. I'm not much of a comic book girl, but I enjoy the movies made from them usually. But I love horror, monsters, and practical effects. Which means that when the first images started coming out for Hellboy, it had my attention. A big red dude with sawed off horns, a fishman, and a fighter girl? I was in. I had no idea what the story was going to be about, but I was in. Add Guillermo del Toro at the helm, the man who had just given us the Fantastic Blade 2, as well as Kronos and the Devil's Backbone. I was more than in. Soon came news that the director and stars would be at Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors in New Jersey. Actually, it was a crossover event between Fangoria and Chiller, and I was already a fan of the Fango Weekend, so I figured I'd go. So I convinced my bestie that we needed to go, and we got tickets, a room, and just headed there, where not only were we going to have a fantastic convention, but friends were getting married on stage that weekend, so it was one of those cannot-miss things. I went to the show, I saw some of the Hellboy stuff, met them kind of in the autograph area, and just didn't make a fuss. I wanted to see the movie for sure though, but do not get me wrong, I just get awkward with people sometimes, and I was new to the convention world, so there are no photos of me with them or any photos really. At least, not in my photos. I do think the former best might have some. My knowledge of comic books was still pretty much nil when I met up at the convention with friends a couple of months later, and while hanging out in New York City. He told me all I needed to know about Hellboy, the... BPRD, and Mike Mignola. Thanks, Mario. With his info and multiple magazine articles about the film, I was pretty sure this movie was for me. Come April, I was right there to see it. I think we might have seen a preview screening of it, but memory is a faculty that forgets, especially with ADHD, so I'm unsure. I do know I loved it right away and knew I wanted more. Now these days, I can look at it with the brain of a 22 years experienced film reviewer as opposed to a 3 year film reviewer at the time, so my thoughts on it have changed a bit or rather matured. I can look at this film through the lens of, it is actually good, and not just, I love this! How the film maintains a 9 out of 10 these days? Well, multiple ways. First, the story. This is a film that serves as the introduction to the characters. Those who had read Hellboy's source material didn't need this, but most of the film going audience did. I know I did back in the day. Now, it still works. We get a bit of an intro to the characters in a way that works, using a new agent assigned to the BPRD who needs to be explained who they are, what they do, and why he's there. Easy, simple, done correctly here. The characters are given enough time to be fully fleshed out beings, some human, some not so much. They take the time to also establish who they are to each other, but the film does not put too much exposure here. It manages the difficult balancing task in giving exposure and not boring the viewer. The action here is fun. We get an adventure, some excitement, and a good number of monsters. This is a monster film after all, and this is what works here. The story is simple enough to get into it easily. The characters are introduced but not oversimplified, and the way the film moves along gives the story and characters time to develop while keeping a good pace. Yes, a good pace. I'm looking at you, recent comic book adaptations like Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, adventure films like Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Brevity and pacing are often forgotten in an effort to give a bigger show. Hellboy knows that we can get plenty shown in a decent runtime with good pacing, keeping the viewer involved and entertained throughout. The writing here is credited to Mike Mignola, of course, Peter Briggs, and Guillermo del Toro, with del Toro also directing. The work here is solid. The writing as explained above flows just right. The direction shows that Del Toro knew what he wanted and made the most of his budget, bringing all these monsters, good and bad, to life. He clearly had a vision and worked to get it done, get it on screen, and give monster kids everywhere exactly what they wanted. Del Toro is one of those directors with that very rare, almost perfect career course. The man makes amazing movies with his incredible passion and imagination. He loves monsters, it's clear, and very much applies here. His style is like an adult horror dream world influenced by Hammer Films, Universal Monsters, and all the best of practical effects artists. 
The man is one of us, a fan first, then a filmmaker, and he creates what he would like to see, something that brings him to another level entirely. The cast of anti-heroes and monsters here is just right. Hellboy is played by Ron Perlman, who does fantastic work with the part. He has the attitude down and gives him a bit of depth. Doug Jones as Ape Sapien steals the show. The man is amazing and can basically do no wrong, but his work here is particularly stellar, giving Abe some odd shade of humanity while setting him in complete otherness. He's odd, he's charming, he's the logic to Hellboy's brawn. Then we get Selma Blair as Liz Sherman, one of the very few ladies in this film and the only lady on the BPRD team. She's conflicted and doing so just right. Playing the head of the BPRD is John Hurt as Trevor Broom Brunholm, a scientist who has seen war and raised Hellboy. His work is, as usual for Hurt, perfect. Then you add Rupert Evans as the newbie Jeffrey Tambor as the bureaucrat handling the BPRD, a few others, and you have a well-rounded team on the good guys side. On the bad guys side, we have Carell Roden as Rasputin, who does decent work, but something feels like it's missing here. And it may be in the writing or something like that. He's the bad guy. It would be great for him to steal a few scenes and run with them, but he doesn't. This may have been planned, but it creates an imbalance between the good and the bad here. Biddy Hodson and Ladislav Buren round out the human and humanoid bad guys. Buren stills a few scenes here. The scene presence is so good and his physicality in the part is just on point. Of course, we also get a few monsters here that are man in suits, something Del Toro seems to adore. The monsters here are fun to watch and have aged well. The secret for this? Practical effects. The fact that Rick Baker, yes, THE Rick Baker, was a makeup consultant on the film shows that the effects were taken seriously. His body of work is epic. From It's Alive to King Kong, Star Wars, The Howling, Thriller, Wolf, The Frighteners, Men in Black, The Wolfman, Maleficent, and so many more. The man is incredibly talented and creative. Definitely the right man to be the consultant here. The practical effects themselves were done by Spectral Motion and Cinovation. One of the best designs in the film can be seen on Hellboy and Abe Sapien, but also on Samael played by monster actor Brian Steele. The character and interpretation of it are both impressive here. To work with all the amazing visuals created here in special effects, decor, performances, etc., the cinematography by Guillermo Navarro perfectly pairs with Del Toro's direction. The two of them have worked together more than once, and Navarro has worked on quite a few memorable films such as Kronos, Desperado, Four Rooms, From Dust Till Dawn, Spawn, Before Hellboy, and a bunch more since. His images work just right when there's a lot going on, when the world is not quite as it normally is, and when the film requires attention to details. To work with the images, Marco Beltrami was hired to write the score. Horror fans know his name as he seems to be the go-to guy for many horror films with titles like Scream, Mimic, The Faculty, The Crow's Salvation, Dracula 2000, Resident Evil, and Blade 2, to name a few of his pre-Hellboy credits. Since then, the man's career has only gone up and up. He's a solid choice here and his work is what the film needed. It's hard to explain, but it's perfect for a comic book adaptation with some epic bits here and there. As a horror fan and a fan of well-made, thought-out entertainment, Guillermo del Toro is at the top of the best film directors out there. Not knowing much about Hellboy at first, his vision and the images shown sold me on the film. Then I learned about the source material, saw some of the books, and was just excited to see it on the big screen. The film itself is fantastic and so easy to fangirl all over with an amazing cast and so much talent involved. It could not possibly fail, and it didn't disappoint. These days, it's still a great watch, and one I pull from the collection semi-regularly as a rewatch, as a sort of Saturday morning cartoon for grown-ups done by a big kid with her heart in the right place. It's not surprising the film got a sequel, Hellboy 2 The Golden Army, four years later, which I might prefer these days. Of course, the character begged for more screen time, and he got some in animated form, and in that 2019 attempt at a series reboot. There was good talent there too, but something wasn't quite right. It's like they knew fans wanted a third live-action Hellboy from Del Toro, and the universe blocked the perfection from repeating itself. That being said, the first cinematic adaptation of the BPRD's adventures was just right, and exactly what most fans wanted. So going in a different direction again would be doomed. Fans have their disc of the first two films, and they can easily go back to them and share them with new future fans. I know that's what I do when someone says they've never seen Del Toro's Hellboy. As a fan, I still see it as a great film. As a film reviewer, I still see it as a great film as well, and one that has become a classic for many reasons.